you know what I thought was so neat? Like, I, the challenge to me was, is it possible to change the personality of the car by just putting a new body on it? You know, does it change the experience, right? You no, know, you feel like a big V8 powered Maserati from the mid 60s, you know? Yeah, you think so? That's an, I, I kind of felt like a fighter plane almost, like that. Yeah, it's that's got that so, Warbird kind yeah, of yeah. torque. Well, you got plenty of power, that's for sure. <laughs> Garage, something very special here. This is a car called the Rungi Valeno. We will find out what that means. You know, it's interesting. In the late 1800s or the early 1900s, America had craftsmen. There were people who built one off things. You know, if you came from a, a, a small town, there might be a gun maker and he would make one or two or maybe three or four guns a year because he was a craftsman. When precision parts came in, when assembly lines came in, all those people kind of got put out of work because they couldn't compete. Uh, so the craftsman disappeared and the assembly line worker came in and kind of took his place. But in the last few years, we've seen a lot of craftsmanship coming back. People want something special. They want something handmade. And that's what this is. Young man, Chris Rungi, he's been on our show before. Uh, you've seen some of his Porsches. He's got his own YouTube channel. Uh, this is a handmade car built entirely by hand. You know, it's interesting. Uh, when the watch industry in Switzerland was going full bore, suddenly the Swatch came in, all these electronic watches came in, and they were in a dilemma because they were losing their shirts because precision timekeeping pieces, although not handmade, but mostly electronic, and it almost killed the Swiss watch industry until they decided to really go handmade and make beautiful watches where everything was exposed and you saw how it worked. And then the industry popped back because people wanted something unique, something different. And that's what this is. This is a car that someone commissioned. It's the only one that there is. It's the only one like it. There must be 5,000 hours worth of work into this thing. Let's find out exactly what it is. Let's bring in the CEO, designer, the head chief bottle washer guy, everything at uh, Rungi Cars. Chris, come on in. Good to see you, my friend. You too, Jay. Uh, yeah, this is very impressive. It, it really is. It's just nice to see handmade stuff being appreciated. Because I was saying in the intro there, this is like one of those bar bets. You said, hey, what has more precision parts, a Model T or a Rolls Royce? Oh, Rolls Royce. No, it's the Model T. Because they turn out 100 of them an hour, and boom, boom. Every part had to be exactly. Rolls Royce would go, eh, take a little more off. <laughs> And that, they would hand fettle everything on the car until yeah. it was perfect, which is, which is what you do here. You know, and it's good to see this kind of craftsmanship being appreciated again, because I know you've got a lot of people come to you now. You're the young guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, Marcel, the, the wonderful, uh, he, he did my Duesenberg, the one over there, mm -hmm. that, uh, that coupe. He handmade that whole body for me, and he's gone now, and it, it's, it's a lost art, so the fact that you, and you're the old guy now, which I find funny now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we were like a kid when I first met, and now you got, now you, how old's your son now? He's 18. All right, so you've got an 18-year-old, uh -huh. and you got, you know, hey, Mr. Rungi, can we talk? You know, you're like the old guy now. You're like Marcel. You're the new Marcel. So that's, that's exciting. So tell us, what do we have here exactly? So this started as a 2004 Dodge Viper, mm -hmm. SRT10, Roadster, and uh, we landed on that. Initially, my client was kind of interested in using a Corvette basis, but when we started to consider the electronics and, and then the underpinnings that we'd have to chop away to get this body on it, we landed on the Viper. And we found a 4,000 mile uh, 2004 Viper, immaculate condition, and that was the donor car. That's more in keeping with Carol Shelby's original intent. Yeah. Big V10 manual transmission. You couldn't even, well, you still can't get a, uh, an yeah. automatic with, with a Viper. Okay. Yeah, and the beauty of the Viper, you know, when they first slated to introduce the Viper, their inspiration was, it was the, you know, great sports cars of the 60s. Right. The Shelby, the uh, Bizzarinis, and, you know, these really raw right, sports right. cars. So is this all done on the English wheel? So what I start with, you know, flat sheets of aluminum, and I have a leather bag filled with lead birdshot, and that sits on top of a tree stump. So I'll make my patterns and then take, you know, the mallets and hammers and pound the shape into the aluminum and then smooth it on an English wheel for finishing. Yeah, and for people who don't really understand this, how hard it is, if this was steel or other people, if they were going to paint it, 
you'd fill this in with body filler. Yeah. In place, and you, you get it all smoothed out. Yeah. And it's it's very smooth now, but if if you want to just fill in this little, and that's what you do, and then you have mm -hmm. those. Then the first cold day, it all pops out again, <laughs> and the paint cracks and everything else. So that's what's amazing about this. You're seeing it in its rawest form, and it, it looks incredibly smooth to me. I mean, I oh, like thank you. the patina. I like the way it looks this way, as opposed to filling in all the slots and the, the rivets mm -hmm. and screws and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, that's really, that's what I fell in love with when I first saw the raw aluminum coachwork post-war cars mm -hmm. uh, at Amelia Island. And the bodywork told the story of you know, the history of metal shaping. And at that time, you know, the Italians were using certain tools, the Germans were using certain tools. And to kind of relive that journey through my yeah. work, it's just, it's what I love about this whole thing. And what gauge thickness of aluminum is it? It's 63 thousandths. Okay, oh, well, that's yeah. pretty good. That's reasonable. It's pretty thick. Thick, isn't it? Yeah. I know when the Muras, when they did the first Muras, they were so thin, you could put your thumb, I mean, your thumb would leave an imprint if uh -huh. you pressed on it. Like, well, that's not good. And then plus they'd go like this down the road, they'd flex. So yeah. when they went to the later mirrors, they used a heavier gauge, but not even that heavy, probably maybe two thirds of that. Wow. So, so, yeah. this is, this is pretty, so this is pretty. Yeah, it's pretty robust. Right, right. Yep. Yeah, very nice. Mm -hmm. So how much savings over the fiberglass body? And the fiberglass body is not light on the No, fiber. it's pretty heavy. I couldn't yeah. believe how heavy the hood was when we replaced it. Right. Um, I think we probably shaved off 250 pounds. Yeah, so that puts it, I think the original car was 3,400 pounds. So we're, you know, down to 3,200, 3,150. Is this the Viper windshield? You have to recap. That is the original windshield. Okay, so you keep that, right? Yeah, we tried to make everything Viper disappear on it, but the windshield was one of the things that we kept. Yeah, no, it looks fine. It doesn't look out of proportion or, hey, why is it straight up when it should be? I mean, yeah. it all looks fine. To build the car, we actually, I initially was going to have the underpinnings 3D scanned mm -hmm. and you know, everybody is saying, you got to use technology. It'll make it so much faster, right? So I had a guy come in and scan the underpinnings, had the scans sent to a designer in the UK. They just weren't any good. He couldn't use the scans. So then I went as far as to trying to basically loft the car. Do you know the, what lofting is? Go ahead. It's, it's uh, in boat building when they'd actually climb up in the loft, look down at the boat oh, and see. lay out the grid of yeah. the body shapes. So I did that manually, taking measurements off of every key point to manually give him the dimensions he needed to make, uh, to digitize the, the uh, body design that I had come up with. And it still didn't work. <laughs> so we ended up, I finally said, okay, I'm just gonna do it the old fashioned way. And I made a tube buck, an aluminum tube buck. I shaped this half of the car and I made notes on every tube and told my son, go ahead and copy them and he built the other half, the driver's oh, half right. yeah, of yeah. the tube buck. Well, that's the way that uh, my Bugatti normally sits over there. Mm -hmm. uh, it was built when, when they made that recreation body for it. It was started with a, with a wooden buck and, and did the whole thing. Yeah. 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 Marcel did that too on the, uh, the Duesenberg. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's great about craftsmanship. It really, you, you can't assemble on it, you, you, you know. No, and it took us about a total of two and a half, three weeks to do that process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why, I, you ever see the movie Quigley Down Under with Tom Selleck? I don't think I have. Well, he, he plays a guy in the Old West, but he's got a rifle, a long rifle. that was uh, an actual rifle built in period. It's just beautifully made. And he hits something like 780 yards. I'm just in Korea, he's at, there's a wet society and signs <laughs> up. And it, it, you know, to, to just hold something that's hand built and handmade really gives you a sense of pride. And a, and a sense of ownership because they, there used to be guilds all across America of woodworking guilds and they would be the best craftsmen, but they, they did one at a time. When it's done, it's done. Maybe it takes a year. When it's done, it's done, you know. Mm -hmm. The English too are great at that. That's why they, it's the English wheel. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Okay, let's see what else do we have. So I imagine brakes are all stock Viper, correct? Stock Viper brakes, okay. custom wheels. We designed them, they're based off of Campanolo style. Right. We use the stock Viper wheel and tire size. The headlight lenses, you know, we thermal form those out of uh, Perspex. Um, right, oh, well you got covers on the lenses, yeah. Which, yep. Okay, yeah. And you've got it open here purposely to get to keep condensation out of there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. let a little bit of air breathe through. And the hood scoop is functional? Yeah, absolutely. This, you know, this engine needs a lot of air, so that, that mouth on the front and right. then the hood scoop 
uh, pretty much supply air to the factory designated spots. Well, it looks very Italian from the front. And I love the gated shifter, which the, which the real car never had. Yeah, 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 yeah that's that great. was pretty trick to come up with that. And stock exhaust. Yep, stock exhaust. Now we do have full flow cats right. and uh, stainless headers on it. Very so nice. So it breathes a little bit better. Can we open the hood? Absolutely. Oh boy, this, oh, this looks great. Look at this, very nice. Yeah, so we cleaned up the engine. Um, the intake originally had that kind of textured finish. Right. Um, so we polished the intake, polished the uh, valve covers, and then, as I said, did the stainless headers. You know, it's interesting because body guys are not chassis engineers and vice versa. So you got something you know that works, that handles, yeah. it's fast, and you're just changing the physical appearance of it to give it a, make it a little lighter, a little faster, a little racer mm -hmm. without sacrificing. Because I see that a lot. A lot of see people, they design something, but it doesn't drive that well. It drives great, it looks kind of clunky. Basically all of the service points on the car, we did a full service on it before yeah. we brought it out here. And it's so easy to service this yeah, thing. Yeah. It, all the panels still come off the bottom like factory. Right, right. Uh, the, the wheel arch covers all drop down to access what you need to get to in there. So we were able to do what you see here without really sacrificing any of the functionality. Very nice. Let's see. And let's take a look at the dash. Obviously, yeah. let's bring this down again. All right. So you still got all factory air and all that stuff. Yeah. I like the steering wheel. Yeah, so the steering wheel I designed and a friend of mine, Kevin Fitzke, he's a master boat builder. He took the design and he built the steering wheel and the uh, shifter. Oh, that's so great. So that's black walnut. It's, it's the same walnut that I used to build my shop. We right. had extra leftovers. Oh, so. that's funny, yeah. Yeah. So. Console, the dash, um, all the HVAC system has been rerouted to the new vent placement, you know, for right. defrost, dash vents. We even retained the original stereo system uh, with the exception of using a Bluetooth head unit that's hidden. Now this is... Now this does not open from the back, right? Not, not from here, there's no. a trunk on the very back. Oh, I see, it opens that way, okay. Yep. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. That's interesting, I kinda like these slats though, that looks cool. Well, a friend of mine was telling me, you know, when you use, this is another uh, plexi window, and at high speeds, well, you know this, they have a tendency to yeah. uh, <laughs> blow oh, yeah. out, right? Yeah, yeah. So we did the slats to help retain, and then kind of a leather parcel shelf here. Yeah. All. You know, oh, I see, they, and then you open through there, is that correct? Yes, yeah, right here. And We can get a Wendy <laughs> single patty hamburger through there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then the battery is still located gotcha. off in its original spot. We have a battery cut off back here. I like Valeno, it's got my name in it, so it's very cool. <laughs> and now, that means uh, poison in po Italian, or poison. venom. Oh, venom. Yeah. So venom we, is better because it's a viper. You know, poison yeah. is, be, what, are you going to be dead with driving the car? <laughs> yeah. I love the taillights. It looks very Ferrari GTO-ish. You know, those are, what are those taillights off of? They are, I believe they are from a GT40. Oh, okay. I, yeah. The 904 and the GT40 had similar taillights. Um, there's slight differences, and these are right in that same line. I think that's what Gordon Murray did with the F1. He, I love the GT40. I think, I think everybody loved the GT40 taillight. Now is the fender width the same as the stock Viper or is it a little... Oh. It's a little narrower. It's on, narrower. On this body, I mean they're, you know, they've got so much shape that it looks right. wider, but yeah. yeah, the original Viper body hung out over the wheels a, a good bit. Oh, that's couple interesting because it does, it does look like it would be wider, but that's just an illusion, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think people have any idea how hard this is to do. <laughs> I guess if you want to get an idea, take a pad, a, get a pad and a pencil and sketch it. It'll never look anything like this. Yeah, it was a huge undertaking. And then, I mean, proportioning, you know, when people build custom cars and do a full body, the wheel arches are always something, when you look at it, it's like, no, something's off. Yeah, you know? something's off. When, yeah. when you look at the, the shape of the wheel arches. So that's really something to me that proportions the whole body and makes everything fit. That was the one thing I hated about the 66 Charger. But mm -hmm. the wheels are always, and, and the uh, Ellsville Tornado, the wheels are always too inboard a little bit. And it looked, it looked lost in the wheel well. Yes. It, you know, it, to getting all those proportions right is really hard. It and is. And you've done it here. It really is a beautiful job. Thank I mean, you. Because it's just sometimes 
either too wide here or, or something, but it, it, it just fills out the wheel well perfectly. You know, I see a little bit of kind of Ferrari Daytona. I see, a, I don't see any sort of Viper. Maybe there's a little Viper in it, but more Italian. And the front end and the grill looks very Italian. Mm -hmm. And this is nicely done here. Even this piece, this is so hard to do to come up with a shape that looks right. Yeah, and flows with you know right, right. with the, the spears over the fenders. See, I'm one of those people that cuts first and then measures. Oh, that's <laughs> wrong. I'll just, I think this is okay. Oh, that sucks. I got to start again. Yeah. How how much waste do you come up with? I mean, when you have sheets of aluminum, you're pound. Ah, that's wrong. Can you when you pounded something into shape, can you reuse it again? Or do you have to just sort of put so, that aside and start with a, a clean flat sheet again? In some cases, you can reuse it. So what happens, I, you know, when I get my metal, it has a certain hardness. Right. And it's, the hardness is H14, so it's right at the mid-range from being fully hardened to soft. Right. And I can anneal the metal so that I heat it up, and that brings it down to H0. So it's okay. dead soft again, and then I can reshape it. Okay. So I may, like the panels with a lot of compound curve, I may anneal those, you know, four or five times in the shaping process. And how do you heat it? What do you use to heat it? I just use a map gas torch, typically. Okay. A lot of guys will use like a rosebud torch with oxyacetylene. Um, but you, you don't get the metal red, do you? You just get it No, warm. aluminum won't turn red. Right, with right. With aluminum, it'll almost look like sugar. Right. And then it's done. Right, okay. I, then you can't use it again. So it'll it's just fall through. It's almost like a heat gun, almost more than a yeah. flame. You just yep. want it soft enough okay mm -hmm. yeah and the way that you can tell when it's annealed it's kind of funny if you put magic marker on the panel and when the magic marker burns off that's really close to being h0 oh that's interesting okay mm -hmm. and with the oxyacetylene you would actually use a, a soot so you cover the whole panel in black soot that's the old school way and then you would burn the soot off and it would be dead zero and how big a panel do you use it's like to make this fender this is all one piece with the exception of this, of course. Uh, but is this two pieces? So it's made in three pieces. Okay. This is one piece, two, and three. Okay. And then the nose goes into another section. So you've joined metal here, right? Yep, there's a weld right down the middle. Oh, I see, okay. No, I, I, I see it now that you mention it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there's one right here. Okay, look at that. But it's so infinitesimally small. But mm -hmm. wow, that's pretty amazing. I mean, can you ever get a dent in it you can't get out where you go, hey, you got to make a whole new piece again? Or you can almost work with it. It depends. If, if it gets creased, when yeah. it puts a hard crease in it, that's when it gets difficult to repair right. the dent. If it's, you know, just kind of a, a pushed in, you can usually push it back out and massage it and bring it back to where it needed to be. And you made these, are these wiper covers yours as no, well? No, those are the original wipers. Oh, and we stripped the original finishing off of them. I see and kind of patina them to look more period correct. Will you ever paint the car or will always, yours always, always be well, raw aluminum? Well, that's what's interesting. So I've kind of painted myself into a corner with having all the polished cars, right? right. My son is a very talented painter and he's interested in this, so I think it might be fitting for him to do a series right. and paint his cars. Well, it just looks great. Are these functional as well? Yeah, those pull air out of the cockpit. Yeah, right. and these pull air off the engine, right. and that's brake duct area right, out of right, that one. Right. Well, just beautifully done. Can we take it for a ride? Absolutely. Let's give it a shot. This is okay. exciting. Let's go.
Uh, that's what we're doing. So we took the original, you know, a lot of the original control system, the ECU, and um, rewired it. So you can see the odometer's not in there on the yeah. gauge. Phone. Yeah, so the odometer and all the readout is hidden down underneath the dash. Oh, I see. So, you know, we tried to make it look uh, vintage, get rid of all the modern uh, items that were there. So how does it feel compared to your other Vipers? Is it pretty similar? Well, I mean, the power is the same, you know, it feels... No, it's very nice, but it, I like the look. I like the feel of this wheel. Uh-huh. I'm not sure if you sit a little bit lower. Maybe you do. Well, I had to take a total of three inches out of that seat yeah. because the headroom is so tight in these cars. Um, so I'm sure you're, you're feeling a lot lower than the yeah, stock. No, but I like it. I don't feel like I have to, I'm looking over the wheel, you know what I mean? Sure. No, it's fine. Yeah. this came out 
and uh, you know having you see it and the customers happy that that kind of puts icing on the cake. No, oh, it's really it's really terrific. The driving business is extreme. usually when people modify the driving position, it just seems off somehow. But this yep. is very nice. I love the wheel. I love like I'm. I, it, I mean, psychologically, you got to be comfortable in the car, you know. Definitely. Well, the first time I went to mount the seat in, and my head was up in the headliner, and I was crooked neck. I thought, oh, we've got a problem. Uh, but, you know, cutting the, removing the seat slider from underneath the seat frame added about an inch and a half. And then um, cutting the foam down, I was able to cut about an inch and a half out of the seat foam. Right. And the seats, are, they're the original seats, but they're completely reshaped. Right. You well, know? it's very comfortable. I don't feel like I'm thin, sitting on a thinner pad or anything. Oh, good. So. Do you have any cars that are rebodied, like modern drivetrain in your shop that are in your collection? No, uh, the rebody of the, the Marcel Duesenberg. Okay. That uh, Bugatti Type 57 is a rebody. Gotcha. On a Bugatti chassis. Yeah, the, my previous cars have been either like one off custom chassis that I had made. The first two builds I did on Formula V chassis, just because the Formula V is so usable, it's so simple to work on, yeah. and you know I really didn't intend to start building cars for other people. I just wanted to build one for myself. Right. That was the quickest way to be able to get the thing going, and on a shoestring budget, you know, you can get a nice Formula V for four thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. excited about that. Well, it's nice to see the coach building craft still alive and well in America. You know, without you and a few other guys, this whole thing could have died out. So it's great you keep it alive. And you know, by the time you're my age, you probably have 20 or 30 guys like yourself that learned their trade from you, you know? Well, yeah. Well, thank you, Jay. That's an honor. Oh, yeah. That'd be, uh, that's cool. Yeah. And you know, since you featured my first cars on your show, What's really neat is I've had more and more young people reaching out that are interested in this. So I have to thank you for that too. Cause well, no, well, that's great. I mean, I, you know, people just, well, how do you learn this stuff? That's kind of the, the question I always get. Like people go, how do you find a secondhand Bugatti? How do you find, well, you, you get in with a crowd that knows people who know people, you know? Sure, yeah. I think it's encouraging to a young person they see another young person doing it as well. Absolutely. I think every kid dream, you sit there at school or whatever and you're drawing cars. And then for me, when I realized I could actually build this thing and figure out how to do it, I mean, that just takes it to a whole new level. It, it, you know, you feel so empowered and you learn new techniques. Did you ever see an Apollo? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's back in the 60s. I mean, that was a, a college kid who built a car. He sent it to Italy to have the coach work built. Oh, really? The bodies were like $4,500 a piece. Wow. And he built them and he sold, I don't know, 50 cars, quite a few. Yeah. Quite a few. And, it, and it, a good looking car, Buick, little Buick V8 in it. Yeah, I've seen them, but I didn't know the story. If you're not a craftsman and you dream of building a car, they can come 
to you and you they tell you what they want and you can build it for them. Absolutely. And that's how this came to life, you know? Yeah, yeah. You kind of laid out the loose floor plan and I actually had this sketch. I had drawn it three years before he came to me. Yeah. And then we took that sketch and sent it off. Well, we did some refining and then we sent it off to Alberto Hernandez. Do you know Alberto? No. He's great, great uh, designer and artist. And he illustrates it, really brings it to life. Right, right. And, and we illustrated it over the dimensions of the Viper chassis. So this was your design, right? Yes. So the customer comes to you, not sure what he wants. You design something and then they give some input. Is that how it works? Yep. Yep. They give enough input to kind of set the trajectory. Right. And then throughout this build, my customer, you know, we stay in close touch and he continually gets updates and, and sends ideas and thoughts and yeah that's um, great yeah it's pretty fun With a couple of my customers they've been collecting parts for 40 years yeah old italian stuff so one my number 10 build specifically we had a great time going through his parts bins all these old ferrari parts ferrari ignition parts and getting to you know bring these things back to life yeah that's, that's great yeah that's really enjoyable now what do you advise people to polish this with any good metal polish or? Yeah, you know, with this, I had to look into like the Airstream, you know, the old campers, and yeah. then Warbirds. And the, the common polish with those two uh, types of, of vehicles, I guess, um, is Nuvite. Well, you know, we, we have a line of stuff out. Yeah. That's kind of how I got started because I couldn't find a metal polish I like. Every really? metal polish that worked, I'd look at the rag and I'd have specks, specks of bits of chrome in it, you know, sure. it was like pumice in it. Was, so we work with some chemists and we developed uh, a chemical polish that works using chemicals as opposed to uh, having any sort of like sand-like material. Yeah. And it's worked really well. Interesting. It's worked really well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the stuff that I use has a real grit to it. Yeah. And it cuts the surface, yeah. you know. And then I get asked all the time how to polish aluminum. What I found is bringing it up to about a 600 to 800, because I sand it first, right, right. 600 to 800 grit, and then you go to the polish. Right, right. If you go to a 1,000 or 2,000, it doesn't want to polish as good. It gets really cloudy. And, right, right, yeah. Yeah, so it likes to have almost that abrasive surface, that rough surface for the the polish to come in and really cut. Well, for a little bit of that cut, we, but, but with chrome, oh yeah, you're totally you're, different. You're peeling the chrome off with the with the pumice. In yeah, it, you, know? you don't want that. It's like a lot of a hand soap, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every time I polish this car, I take a layer off the aluminum, and that's what you want to do. Right, right, right. It's funny. Yep. How long can this sit without polish before it starts to go look dingy, as they say? Yeah, it's. I would say about two years. Oh, that long? Yeah. It'll, it'll hold a decent polish. Now that's being garaged, you know, yeah. in, in a garage and being used, you know, maybe every other weekend or even every weekend, whatever. Right. Because the sun oxidizes it and of course the air oxidizes it. You don't ever seal it, do you? I do, I have a sealant that I just found. Again, the Airstream guys turned me on to it and it seems to help quite a bit. I wonder if our radiant will work on it because that gives a, silicone finish to it yep it probably could the thing that i found with these sealants some of them will make it turn blue they'll almost put a blue haze into the yeah. aluminum and i don't really like that i like the deep rich reflection right right well chris thank you very much my friend oh absolutely i'm really pleasure, proud of you it's great to see and you got your son in the business and it's great to see a father and son team doing stuff it's really nice oh thank you so much yeah it's terrific terrific congratulations on all your success and you're like a famous guy now, so that's that's cool. Uh, I don't know about Thanks that. For coming back and talking to us little people, we appreciate that. <laughs> and people can go to your, what it's run, what give me your rungicars.com. Rungicars.com. Yeah, Check that's it out. my website, and that's the same YouTube channel too. Rungicars.com. Rungicars.com. Yeah. See you guys next week. Thanks for checking it out.